Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the Humanities Festival. My name is Eric Frey. I'm a journalist with the Standard in Vienna. And uh, our guest and uh, partner here is Daniel Cohen, historian who was, grew up in France, studied in Tel Aviv and at New York University, where he worked with Tony Judd, who is also well known, known in Vienna about European post-war history. Uh, and particularly the, the role of refugees in this history. Uh, Daniel Cohen was a visitor with the EVM and is currently a senior fellow at the Simon Wiesenthal Institute for Holocaust Studies here in Vienna. And working on a book on philo-Semitism in Europe from 1945 to the present. Um, which is interesting. Everyone talks and thinks and writes about anti-Semitism, and you are writing about philo-Semitism. Um, what made you interested in the subject? Okay, well, thank you, and, and thank you all for, for being here. Um, the short answer is that we have a lot of history of anti-Semitism, um, whether in pre-war Europe, but also in post-war Europe that give us a pretty fair picture of the shifting meanings, the definitions, the functions of anti-Semitism from the liberation of the camp um, to the present. Um, interestingly, I ask myself if we could do the same with what is supposed to be the opposite of anti-Semitism. Philo, love, Semitism, both terms are very a, a ambivalent, there is no love, and Semites do not really exist. But try to think if we can reframe at the core of the post-war experience a phenomenon that we can loosely call philo-Semitism. I, I came to the topic by working on refugees in the 1930s all the way to the 1950s, and in particular Jewish refugees, and anybody who works on the topic is puzzled by the change of tone in international diplomacy at the level of NGOs, at the level of international organizations on Jewish refugees, right? The scum of the earth of 1938, the Avian Conference, turned into, in 1946, 47, 48, of countries that are worthy of help, of resettlement, that ought to find a country, and it plays a big role We know anti-Semitism is evil, uh, is, is one of the scourges on the, of, the, of, of, of civilization. Uh, does this mean that philo-Semitism is a form? No. No. Uh, in fact, there are many Jewish jokes uh, uh, warning us about the usefulness and the legitimacy about philo-Semitism, because there's, although there is an ism there, there are many definitions to what we call philo-Semitism. At the very least, it could be reverse anti-Semitism. On the other end of the spectrum, it could be, or it means, a positive identification or positive discourse about Jews. And there are many layers between, between these two poles. But if we finish answering to you, yes. if we choose to be critical about philo-Semitism, then it's possible to recast it at the center of the European experience, even if it's not provocative. Now, when you say reverse anti-Semitism, what does that mean? Okay, so philo-Semitism did not start as an act of love. In countries such as Germany and Austria in particular, philo-Semitism, just like anti-Semitism, often functioned as a code. Uh, scholars of anti-Semitism know what I'm talking about. That is to say, a language through which we can paradoxically revive, recreate stereotypes about Jews. Right? If you want to show perhaps... Um, On the PowerPoint, what I'm trying to say? Um, okay. Right? So, um, this is not Photoshop, no? that is the true picture of the Brandenburg yes. Gate two, two years ago. But i um, give you a quick, a quick anecdote to answer your question, if you want to look at the next slide. 
So, so um, the next one. We'll go back to that later on. Okay. The next one. No. Thank you. So in 1955, even in um, Austria, um, a new initiative was born out of the New Republic, Aktion. A friendly Nazi fanatic before 1938, a soldier on the Eastern Front all the way to 1942, injured, comes back to Vienna and becomes an ideologue to educate soldiers in Nazi ideology. He's one of the founders of Action Gegen Antisemitism. So what is the purpose of this? What do we learn from it? Is that philosemitism may be an act of contrition or guilt or has a purpose, in this case, a purpose of what we can call whitewashing, whitewashing guilt, whitewashing the past, starting fresh. The anecdote about this man that fought essentially a genocidal war against Judeo-Bolshevism in 1941-1942, if you want to show the next slide, is that he ends up, of course, writing an ode to um, Karl Marx's Judische Humanismus 20 years later. <laughs> so, it is, needs to be seen for what it is, right? And that is the job that I embraced, is to try to identify patterns yes. of, of philo-Semitic discourse through the period. So was most of it uh, driven by guilt? So is the power of guilt, is also our talk is titled really the main, the main, the, the main aspect here, or were there also other motives which are just as relevant? This is the classic explanation of philo-Semitism, particularly so from people who don't believe in it, who yes. don't want to have anything to do with it. Philo-Semitism is guilt, right? It's not true, it's an expression of guilt. We hear that in the Palestinian intellectuals complain that because of this guilty philo-Semitism, that they have nothing to do with it. They did not perpetrate the We hear that among Jews wary of being turned into model victims, something that they don't want to be part of. Guilt is supposedly the answer to that. The problem is that when we look at the history of post-war Europe, we don't see guilt, but we see mostly indifference to the Holocaust all the way to the 70s is something that is better defined by indifference, although there are various ways to talk about it, than solidarity or sensitivity uh, to the Holocaust. So here, philosemitism is less guilt than an alternative to guilt. Um, this is what I propose in the book. But it's not exactly guilt because, in fact, up until the 1990s in Europe, we don't really have official atonement or guilt. We have, of course, at the beginning of the post-war period, Karl Jaspers, the Schuldfrage, but it's much more about Schuld than about Jews. So it's important to see what was the function of philosemitic discourse, not just to express guilt, in my view, but to replace it or to avoid it through a positive discourse on Jews, of which we can talk about. And one of made quite a turn in their whole attitude and approach to, to Judaism. Um, what was the driving force there? Hmm. Yeah, so you mentioned, you're talking about the, of course, the, rise of the so-called Jewish-Christian dialogue, right? Something Second Vatican Council, Vatican Council Jewish-Christian encounter, which um, we can define, keep joking, as a unnatural act consensual adults and starting with a prayer. Um, that means that the, um, the, the notion of Jewish-Christian dialogue, although it seems very important, was only important on one side, the Christian side. There is a movement towards yeah. Jews there, a movement that has been called a shift from the enemy to brother, contempt to esteem, etc., etc. Why did it happen? Why did Christians move towards Jews? There are many explanations. First of all, they did not explicitly move towards Jews. Christians moved towards modernity. Okay. 
right? It's only when notions of adjusting, of coping with modernity, Vatican II, became or arrived on the church agenda that the Jewish issue also was addressed. But there is something there. Um, in 1965, the Catholic Church recognizes that Jews are not to be blamed for the day side. They halfway acknowledge the role of the church in anti-Judaism, not the Holocaust, I mean in anti-Judaism. And they also, this is the most important thing, elevate Jews to theological partners. Mm -hmm. So that is quite a revolution, indeed, that has, that is one of the important features of the story that we're talking about today. And it, yes, because it also changed a little bit the religious dogmas, because if you have Jews are your partners, um, certain ideas about what, what the the Christians, Christian religion means doesn't fit quite anymore. There was no right? particular incentives for Christians to do so in no. 1945. No. There were more in the 1960s yeah. when the church faced secularization, loss of believers, and also it, it should be said that a lot of outsiders within the church, Jacques Maritain, Jules Isaac in the French case, actually a Jewish convert named Johannes Österreicher, uh, who was actually was a priest here in Vienna who moved the United States were one of the sort of secretive pushers to put the Jewish item on the Second, on Second Vatican Council's agenda. The result is something that we can call a new partnership between Christians and Jews, or at least between Catholics and Jews. This is not nothing. The, the 1960s was also the period when admiration, even love for Israel was at its peak after the 1967, uh, the, uh, after the Six Day War in 1967, there was an outpouring of, of support for Israel among various parts of European society. Uh, what was the link between love for the Jews, philo-Semitism and admiration for Israel? Was this always, was it the same? Was this is a, a very good There is some fight after World War II in Europe, and again, we can look country by country, and the epicenter of that story would not be Vienna, but Paris, for all kind of reason. Paris being the sort of center of the European intellectual scene at the beginning of the post war era. But what happened at the level of defining philo Semitism is that it remained very abstract. Mm -hmm. People like Albert Camus, Sartre, Reflet. High school have great resonance, but remain the stuff of intellectuals. Then comes 1948 and the state of Israel, and there is a possibility to project in a more concrete way new notions about Jews, which many of them were fictional or utopian, on the new Israeli reality. Uh, it came at a price. It's the moment where European anti Semites decided to explicitly invest in the Jews. The Israelis, the Jews, humanity. In the early 70s, perhaps 1982, but it's a moment that the left has somehow forgotten, uh, a moment of gong-ho philo Zionism that is uh, no longer on the agenda. Well, uh, you say it has reached, it reached its peak, 67, and the years afterwards, early 70s, and ever since the public image of uh, of Israel has been on the decline more, now more maybe than ever, particularly in the among the leftist progressive uh, Europeans. Uh, does this also take uh, reduce the, the the motive to be a philo Semite? So is there a change also in attitudes toward Judaism as Israel becomes more and more controversial or even disliked? Right. So Israel, which was not part of the story in 1945, is central to the story of. Europe and Jews today. Yeah, but it's in fact, in, um, in the, um, well, if any chart that shows you uh, increases anti-Semitism, you can immediately correlate the spikes, the upticks, with whatever's happening between Israeli Palestinians at that time. And there's direct connection between events in the Middle East and anti-Semitism in Europe. Right? And let's not get into this, but it's, it's a... Yeah. When we look at it, most of the sort of moderate left in Europe, and that is still what they used to be, still a big way, the Social Democratic Party never abandoned the commitment to a certain idea of philo-Semitism. 
they are critical on certain aspects of Israeli policies, but they never return to the status quo. Maybe Labour is doing it now, and that would be a first transgression of this. I don't think that Labour is doing it, but Corbyn is doing it. have helped us. Mm -hmm. Maybe this is a good chance because you had these other two slides about anti-Semitism that we slip th uh, yeah, that we flip through. Yeah. Maybe because this is the story, if you, t if you talk to also people in Austria, also Jewish representatives, and you say, we'll talk about philo-Semitism, they will say, what do you mean philo-Semitism? We see anti-Semitism on the rise. So is this, is philo-Semitism something from the past and Jews who are living here in Europe are now facing more and more uh, hostility again? As maybe this, so this, this, what as, as this graph would, would suggest? What, what is shocking about anti-Semitism today is not only that it, and we'll get to the description, to the breakdown of this in a second, that is, you know, that represents or, or symbolizes attacks on Jews, or harassment, or at the very least um, makes the life of Jews um, uncomfortable, is that <laughs> no, mine is working now. No, it's fine. It's fine. If it's working better, maybe. Okay. Maybe there's a better. But yes, you're right, Eric. Um, <laughs> we're more likely to wake up in the morning and receive bad news about anti-Semitism than good news about hypothetical philo-Semitism, right? Yeah. Now, if you want to go to the next slide. <laughs> In these bad news, there are, in a sense, good news, is that most of the increase of philo of anti in anti-Semitism that we see, both in the United States and in Europe, are attributed to the internet, or a lot of it attributed to the internet, and no longer to direct attacks, humiliations, or daily harassment that, that Jews experience in Europe otherwise, and quite frankly, in, in a lot of countries. So, the methodology of Antisemitismus Forschung is, is actually a question in and of itself, right? Um, I'm not here to deny any of it, but if we, if we add to the tally of anti-Semites, drunks, xenophobes in the dark, and all kind of people who hide in the internet to spew their venom, we need to quantify it and put that in some sort of perspective. They existed before the internet did not exist. So yeah. if, if you, I mean, there is the chart that we saw before, which is rising, uh, which would be the more, more, more realistic chart in terms of anti-Semitic incidents, but also anti-Semitic attitudes? W how has it developed in Europe over the last 40 years? So at the risk of being provocative, I actually look at this chart with some measure of caution. Yeah. Um, not only because it includes a lot of things that did not or were not considered anti-Semitism in the past, but also because it tends to obscure one fact, is that for the first time in the history of Jews in Europe, the, study of the status of Jews, the life of Jews, the presence of Jews, their visibility in the public realm, and I'm talking about Western Europe, but to a large extent, a lot of countries in Eastern Europe, not all, is uncontested, is uncontested, mm -hmm. right? Uh, Jews can be whatever they want, they, have, they are thriving, and they can decide and, and the kind of faith they want to embrace, the way they want to embrace is uncontested, I would say more, with the full backing of the philo-Semitic state. I use this because, of course, in the history of the Holocaust, the concept of anti-Semitism d'état, uh, which the French have coined, is very important. There is something called philo-Semitism d'état, state follow semitism when je suis charlie or i am charlie demonstrations started in france and when of course the anxiety the panic of french jews what i did speak a lot of them my friends people thinking about exile some people emigration to israel um, the comments that we got from the prime ministers the government and that is true for england or france are not things that you heard in the 1930s if the Jews leave, France will no longer be France. 
Now that could be lip service, right? That could be a politician trying to, to cover their, their, their base, but it's also a change of discourse. So I'd like to keep in mind that despite the, the charts, the life of Jews in Europe today is pretty secure. Mm -hmm. It's pretty secure, at least from the institutional point of view. Second, what the chart doesn't show is the level, not, this time not just an uptick, but quite frankly, of the chart increase in anti-Muslim and anti-Arab perceptions. I mean, there has been, if you want to see it, a transference of anti-Semitic animus, and Mati Bunzel has written about this, from the Jew to the Arab. I can even, in my work, I, I, char I can show you the moment. I found that poll in the late 1960s that finally shows the North African in France way on top of the xenophobic scale. This is something that we also need to remember and, and can explain why Jews are supposedly loved by right-wing parties or populist parties, particularly in our region. Now, let's turn to Austria a little bit. I mean, there is the perception that Austria, if, if Europe turned philo-Semitic after, after 1945, Austria did less of it, uh, less than in Germany, less than in the Netherlands. I mean, there's no, you don't have a football team in Vienna that uh, calls itself the Jews like, like, like Ajax Amsterdam. Is this true? Was Austria a laggard in, this, in this phenomenon? Uh, of course, it is true, again, with, with a caveat. And there was no incentives, as opposed to Germany, for Austrians to engage, to engage in, to engage in philo-Semitism, that is to say, to try to use positive discourse on Jews to regain a footing among the Western nations. In 1943, Austria was already declared the first victim of fascism, and second, the people that were the likely candidates to engage in anti-Semitism, socialists, view themselves also as victims, victims of Austrian fascism. So there was very little left empathy to share, not only for the remaining Jews, but also for remigrants, uh, the people who supposedly returned. And it's clear, and historical research has shown, that there was no particularly warm invitation for Jewish immigrants to ever to Austria. We, we hear a lot about this, l this lack of, of welcoming of, of, of refugees to Austria. Was there really more of it in Germany? And did more Jews return to Germany in high positions than they did to, to, to Austria? No. What there was in Germany is, was what visitors critically called a phallosemitic fashion yeah. under the Adenauer era, mm -hmm. where because of the taboo of anti-Semitism, but also because of Wiedergutmachung, the, no, the only way of talking about Jews was in terms of reconciliation, re-engagement, and particularly monetary compensation, which in and of itself invited anti-Semitic comments, but in the form of philo-Semitism, Jews and money. Mm -hmm. Give them money, they will forgive you. So there is here a, a, a sharp difference. What is less known about Austria is that there has always been a minoritarian minoritarian, right, a minority, marginal, peripheral, a form of subversive, that's right, uh, philo-Semitism. Okay. Now, of course, we need to look for it on the margins. That could be, for instance, in the diary of the very young Ingeborg Machmann, yeah. her making a point to walk with her British Jewish boyfriend in Villach in front of her family to make sure that she is being seen dating a British Jewish soldier. Of course, we have to find these traces in the darkness, so to speak, of the historical materials and make sense of them. But there's no argument that it remained minoritarian, um, at least until the late 1960s. Yeah. Now, some of you probably watched the movie Waldheim's Walzer by Ruth Beckermann last night. And the, 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 I would call it the mythology, or at least the way the narrative narrative is that Austria was more or less forgetting about the past, ignoring it, saying we are a victim until 1986 and then came the campaign, his election, and suddenly Austria woke up and changed. And everyone who's today involved in what you would say philo-Semitism somehow says 86 was the turning point. Is this true? 
Yeah, you're right. I, the, the, the danger to, to uh, excessively focus on the Waldheim affair is really precisely that, to have a sort of a monolithic history of, of permanence and then see a moment of change when things supposedly uh, um, uh, reverse or accelerate or go into a different direction. Um, uh, no, it's not true. What's interesting about it is that, however, is that with the vocal reawakening of the right in Austria around the Waldheim affair mm -hmm. during the first FAP, FPO coalition, coalition and possibly now, what happened is that it has been met by a countervailing opposition that was more than an opposition, that was a real force. Mm -hmm. So paradoxically, should I say, anti-Semites were much more efficient in the 50s and the 60s when they were silent, that is to say, occasionally transgressing the taboo but operating within the taboo than when they were vocal. I hope I, does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. Right? Well, maybe we should go step back one decade and ask for the, the Bruno Kaiski, of course, is a key figure here in the uh, modern history of Austria and also of Jewish Austria. Uh, was Kreisky's popularity, even enduring popularity, did it have to do with the fact that he was Jewish? Was he a product of philosemitism? So I come from a family, a Jewish family, that made a business to hate Bruno Kreisky. Right? Uh, Bruno Kreisky did not extend a cup of tea to Golda Meir. Bruno Kreisky was a self-hating Jew, was probably. Uh, Bruno Kreisky was such and such. So I always found the, 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 the story of Kreisky quite, quite interesting, both politically and also psychologically, quite frankly. Um, let's think of it. Can we name a Jewish prime minister ever in, anywhere in Europe since 1945? There is one, is Laurent Fabius, okay. who made a point to never disclose his Jewishness in the 1980s. The French far right did, because he was accused of having a hand in a, a scandal, a health scandal involving tainted HIV blood, and his Jewishness came into play when he was accused by the far right to, as a Jew to taint the blood, so mm -hmm. to speak, uh, of the French population. But this is somebody, that's, that's the exception. So yeah. Bruno Kreisky is the only Jewish prime minister in Europe since 1945. The previous one was Leon Blum, mm -hmm. right? And the previous one was probably Disraeli, Disraeli yeah. if he was Jewish. So the, um, there's something interesting here. Of course, the price to pay for Kreisky was to do everything he could to deny any affiliation. Well, he did not deny affiliation with Jewishness. He denied affiliation with community Judaism and Zionism. There's something here that we need to go yeah. into it. Most, as you know very well, Kreisky's best friends were always Jews. Yeah. And towards the end of his life, he had to sort of revise his views about Zionism and so on and so forth. So there is something about Kreisky here. And he, may, and he may have been right all along about uh, the uh, in Middle East policy and the question of Palestine, the PLO. Well, and, it's fair and to say that what so. Kreisky was advocating in the early 70s alongside all of Palme and Willy yes. Brandt at that time, looks like mainstream or so left of center politics today, a two-state solution with some sort of territorial yeah. arrangement. Um, there's something here about Kreisky. Now, but did the typical Austrian who was, did not see himself as a philosemite, did he vote for Kreisky also because he was Jewish, even though he was Jewish, or did it just not matter? I think it did not matter. I think, I think, I think Kreisky, Kreisky managed to, to merge and to connect with sort of a, um, a, a mainstream SPO constituency that it did not fully matter. But the voters were always reminded of Kreisky's Jewishness because Kreisky's opponents in 1970, for instance, made a point to indicate to the voters who was the true Austrians. Right? Yeah. So but Kreisky's Jewishness was always in the background. Um, he helped everybody to forget about Jewishness by forgetting about Jewishness. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm not sure that uh, this is the full story about Kreisky. Mm -hmm. right? We'll have to think about it more. I mean, even personal recollections of people who lived through the era, if they perceived, perceived Kreisky as Jewish or just non-Jewish, um, uh, this is an interesting point. Yeah, no. What do you think about it? <laughs> well, I wasn't expecting that question. <laughs> um, um, I really don't know. 
and uh, I, I also think that the, the you're right. In 1970, there was the, uh, his Jewishness was a implicit campaign issue. Afterwards, never again, and not in his party, and not in the, in in any campaign. Also, not by the FPÖ. I think it was just ignored, uh, and it only popped up when it came to the Middle East, when it came to Israel, and of course Simon Wiesenthal. Correct. So this so is Simon where Wiesenthal when Kreisky was kind of made it. Uh, right. And this yeah. is the, the pathological side of Kreisky. I mean, for quite frankly, uh, this is where he actually earned points with the far right yeah. in this country uh, when he attacked Wiesenthal and ultimately lost well, and had to pay compensation. Since, since Austria had a history, and Austrian anti-Semitism had a history with Karl Lueger saying, I decide who is Jewish, uh, one could say the Austrians decided this guy is not Jewish, he's on, he's on our side. Yes. Yeah. Let's turn to... Uh, uh, today. We have a young chancellor today who seems to be the most philo-Semitic uh, Austria ever had. Sebastian Kurz talks a lot about this, this uh, in, in, uh, central mission for Austria to support Israel, also to support Jewish life here uh, in, in Vienna. So he seems to take this very, very seriously. And he has the Freedom Party as his coalition partner that also suddenly uh, it not only supports Israel, but also Heinz Christian Strache turned around and, and made a m quite a strong statement in front of his own Burschenschafter saying we have to fight anti-Semitism. Um, is this the return of philo-Semitism in Austrian politics? Right, so first of all, there is a generation uh, issue here. Kurz, uh, Chancellor Kurz belongs to a young generation of people who essentially grew up with the European Union. With that, whether he wanted it or not, he absorbs of the new norms, or at least the foundational norms of the European Union. Today, they're pretty much, uh, if not trampled over, uh, quite frankly, in jeopardy. But one of them is cosmopolitanism. The other one is Holocaust memory, uh, and so on and so forth. And, and that, I think, uh, Kurtz has no beef with. He doesn't want to stir up the pot, and he belongs to that kind of sort of European identity. Strache. Yeah. Did not. Let's not forget that during the campaign, Kurz and Schache squared off in a debate, yeah. and Kurz had to endure the accusation, of course, of, of having Verzrickungen, that is, entanglements with Mr. Musikant, which Strache pronounced Muzikant, right, in, in the debate to code what he wanted to do, but then Strache did something else. He also said, in our coalition, we will pledge to defend our Jewish compatriots against what? Muslim anti-Semitism. So we're touching upon something else here. Yeah. And the, the, I, I like to call uh, the far right, uh, the, the, the new migrants, right? What kind of migrants? Uh, they, they're migrating from anti-Semitism to philo-Semitism. Um, uh, and is this for real? Can you believe them that they actually believe in it, that they see Jews as a potential or real ally against their new enemy, Islam, um, as Gerd, uh, Wilder, so Gerd Wilders does in the Netherlands and right. others, other right-wing populists do? Uh, or is so it just a trick? Is it just a, is it just a yeah? Let's, not, let's forget that Gerd Wilders is a populist, but a populist that, ki that came from some kind of progressive tradition. That is to say, on other issues, social welfare, Right, um, uh, gay rights, minority rights. Wilders is a progressive, not the Austrian far right. So this, there's a, the difference. Okay. For, Gild for, for, for Wilders, anti-philosemitism means championing a Judeo-Christian morality or Judeo-Christian civilization against the danger. Right. This is something that is, of course, new in the philosemitism of yes. today. It has shifted for something that belonged to progressives. Traditionally, SPO, Catholics, or left Catholics, and is now partially in the hands of people that, in fact, they find themselves either a far right or right of center or populist. So that's, that's one thing. And also, it has a lot to do with containment and exclusion, if needed, of uh, refugees, and particularly Muslim refugees. So, um, so Strache talks also about Judeo-Christian values. That's true. That's so true. He, has he has adopted this language, which, by the way, comes from the United States, also from that evangelicals. Is true. Who that are, is true. Who no, I don't think that's. So is this? Yeah. Does he does he, does he believe it? Yeah. Or is it? Yeah. There, there's two layers, and I, I hate to call it philo-Semitism, but let's call it philo-Semitism yeah. of, of 
FPÖ philo-Semitism, as, as, as interesting as it sounds. Uh, there is indeed this new discourse of protection of Jews, yeah. but also there is a philo-Israelism. That is to say, there is in the far, in, in regimes around, in our region, in, in the Czech Republic, in Slovakia, in Hungary in particular, this sort of split philo-Semitic personality, that is to say, on one hand, Soros is the eternal Jew, on the other hand, Bibi is the future, mm -hmm. right? Uh, that is to say, the muscular Jew won over the cosmopolitan liberal yes. liberal Jew. There's, there's something here, of course, that belongs to the repertoire of philo-Semitism in Central Europe that is, of course, not credible. Are yeah. Jews in danger of being instrumentalized and abused yeah. for in the uh, fight against, the Islam, against Islam? So you hear of Jews in small numbers, in very small numbers. In fact, uh, you know, uh, joining uh, Pegida, joining AfD, um, uh, you even hear of some Jews tempted by a Front National vote in France. Okay, no, uh, Jews in fact are on the fence here. Uh, Jews in fact are on the fence here okay. and um, for the most part, I've not jumped in. I've not jumped in. Um, it's a good question. Uh, some Hasidic communities have yeah. in east of us and in, in all kind of deals with, with a, in the old traditions of, of, of the Jewish presence in Eastern Europe so to deal with the power that you have and make the best of it. So there are interesting alliances being made here, being, being, so to speak, created between Orthodox Hasidic communities and, for instance, Orban in Hungary. No, I it's a real problem. There is a perversion of what philo-Semitism was supposed to be. Yeah. Yeah. Do you see uh, a trend or any chance that Jews in Europe can just achieve what, is what you would call normalcy, where they don't have to fear anti-Semitism, where they don't need philo-Semitism, where they don't have to ask themselves all the time, is it good for us or bad for us? where all these issues just kind of fade into the background? Yeah, so from the point of view of social history, if I were a social historian, I would, I would tell you they have achieved normalcy, frankly, since the 1960s. I mean, modernization, social mobility, all these parameters point to a Jewish success story in Western Europe, including Germany, and frankly, including Austria. So that, that, that if this is a, a definition of normalcy, mm -hmm. then this is it. Then, of course, there is the issue of anti-Semitism. I mean, the, 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 the really, the evil of anti-Semitism is to permanently put into question that normalcy. Mm -hmm. And that discourse is there. It puts into question the normalcy of being a European Jew. There is a backlash against Corbyn because he allegedly put into question the normalcy of British Jews, not just Israel, with which he has a beef, and so be it, but with British Jews. So I'd say yes and no, there is normalcy. There is normalcy, and quite frankly, it's quite an irony. The doctrine of normalcy in Jewish history is not diaspora, supposedly it was Zionism, right? The normal Jews, George Normalisierung, was supposed to be the Jews that left Europe, not lived in it. Well, it's fair to say that there is, dream, there is, there is a Jewish European identity, well, not identity, there is a Jewish European life, mm -hmm. uncontested and unchallenged, except that is regularly sort of put Being under stress or under a stress test, either through terrorism or through other forms of what we may or not call anti-Semitism. Okay. I would like to invite you now to ask questions uh, and if you do please wait for the microphone and you need, you need, a, you need a microphone okay okay i'll try to okay uh, gregor flock a philosopher um some points I would like to mention are uh, yeah, the, the power of guilt uh, that Mr. Cohen mentioned that the Brit British labor is anti-Semitic and that Corbyn does not only have a problem with the policies of Israel but also with British Jews in general. Um, the thing is, I'm not sure if you're aware of this, but uh, a former Israeli cabinet member, some Shalomit Aloni, I believe her name is, uh, mentioned in 2002 on, on video on the Democracy Now! show that anti-Semitism is a trick which 
uh, the state of Israel always uses. So, um, and there are good reasons for Israel and its allies within Britain to use the trick against Corbyn because as you well know, Corbyn is in favor of creating, uh, there, there are recent news where Corbyn said that he wants to acknowledge the, the state of Palestine and so on and so forth. So there are very good reasons to smear Corbyn. So the question yeah. is whether this anti-Semitic issue is a trick um, to smear Corbyn, right? Uh, the question, or my suggestion is that it's very important to... Okay, can you just then ask the question? Then we can I, I, I was just about no, to... Ask the question so yes, can, can I, can I? Thank you. That um, my suggestion or question is that it's very important to distinguish between anti-Semitism and anti. Please ask the question so we, the Daniel Korn can answer. Can you please stop interrupting? I no, I want you to ask a question. Okay, is it okay? Okay, okay. Is it, in your opinion, important that we distinguish between genuine anti-Semitism and uh, legitimate forms of? moderate anti-Zionism, defined as criticism of the policies of the State of Israel, which are then masked as anti-Zionism, uh, anti-Semitism. Yes, well, thank you. So, yes, it's very important to distinguish uh, and to analyze anti-Zionist discourse for what it is and for... Uh, and, and one of the criteria is to see if at which moment anti-Israel, anti-Zionist discourse descends or degenerates into a, a, a tropes or themes or images that traditionally belong to the anti-Semitic repertoire. Or if it's a direct attack on the dignity of British Jews as opposed to the policies of the State of Israel. So I agree with you. I also agree with you that, anti that philo semitism is not necessarily liked or believed by some Israeli governments. It's much more comfortable with the notion of an anti-Semitic Europe. You're absolutely right to say this. Yeah. Is Corbyn an anti-Semite? So, um, uh, Corbyn comes from a, a known sort of uh, part of the labor, the far left of the labor, which expectable is anti-imperialist, anti-racist, but also anti-Zionist. So we understand where Corbyn from from, and there's no surprise there. Anti-imperialist, interestingly enough, Corbyn never really spent much time um, um, investigating or accounting or, uh, for the British, for the trail of blood uh, left by the British imperial uh, history, throughout history, but th nonetheless, he comes from that trajectory. There is no surprise. He doesn't like Israel. There is no surprise, right? And I don't think we should be shocked with this. On top of that, Corbyn has never said anything anti-Semite in his life. However, if what we hear is true, that is to say, we can identify in what he says points of transgression. That is to say, for instance, challenging the loyalty of British Jews uh, today, or putting them under the stress of identifying either with Israel or with morality, and having a cohort of laborites accelerating this trend at the level of social media, then there is a problem. But I personally have no problem with Corbyn being Corbyn, no. Hello. Uh, my, I'm Adrian, a barrister at law from London and Vienna, and I've got three short questions. First of all, Daniel said that there was no Jewish head of state in Europe post-1945 except for Bruno Kreisky. I wonder about Helmut Schmidt, who wrote in his autobiography that he wasn't allowed to have a bar mitzvah because his parents would stand out, said he would stand out. Uh, secondly, Eric, you said that there was no Jewish football team in Austria. I wonder whether you can, can after, after 1945, before there was a team called Hakoa, meaning strength in Hebrew, that was recently revived three years ago in Vienna's second Leopoldstadt district, as a Jewish football and athletic club. Okay, and my third question is, don't you think, Daniel or Eric, that philo-Semitism is already deeply embedded in Austria in the Wienerisch dialect? Because there are so many Yiddish and Hebrew expressions in Wienerisch that always draw a laugh when I, as an Englishman, use them, like Havara, 
for a mate, Kumpel in Germany, Tachel is Reden, to call a spade a spade, Schmarotzer, a parasite, Schnorrer, a beggar. I always get a positive reaction in Austria when I use those expressions, and they go way back into Wienerish history. Yeah, your Wienerisch is probably better than mine. of Viennese language, uh, lingual culture, um, whether it is, sometimes it has an anti-Semitic connotation, very often not. I think most Austrians, Viennese, don't know that Havara has anything to do with Javer. Um, and I also wonder whether the next generation, the younger generation, even speaks Wienerisch anymore. I think this is being, I think it's part of the Jewish heritage which is lost in the city. Thank you. Now, I don't know about Schmidt. I, I'd be surprised, uh, but we'll, we'll see. I, I don't know about Helmut Schmidt. And, and um, yeah, um, I think. Yeah, thank you. Ungurano from the IBM. Daniel, question for you, although we have discussed this topic several times. Any specific form of philo Semitism? On the other side of the Iron Curtain, is there a, a state, stately instrumentalized kind of philo-Semitism in the, in the Soviet Union or in the satellite countries? Thank you. Yes, of course, that's, that's an excellent question. We didn't have time. But it is true that from 1945 to 1989, we think of Eastern Europe as hermetic, and for many good reasons, to any kind of positive sense of solidarity with Jews, uh, to any kind of philo-Semitism. I mean, that is a quick answer and a wrong answer, uh, although we need a little bit more time. But let's just say that outside of the period of hard, of the high noon of Stalinism, right? And that's sort of the beginning of the 1950s, um, that old-style communist anti-fascism, that is to say, the notion that we all were undiscriminate fighters against, uh, against fascism, against Hitler, had something positive to say about the Jewish Brotherhood. At some point, it completely elided the presence of Jews, but in many places, the presence of the idea of Jews as fighters, for instance, a good example, if we look at the changing point, one of the changing points in post-war history is, of course, Willy Brandt kneeling Kneeling where? In communist Poland, in front of what? A monument dedicated to the Jewish ghetto fighters, right? Not to the home army, but the Jewish ghetto fighters. So there was something in, 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 in post-war Eastern Europe which uh, challenges our lazy notions of monolithic, anti-Semitic communism, and it was. Some countries have different paths with Jews. It's difficult to compare Bulgaria, for instance, and Slovakia in the Holocaust. So there's... You're absolutely right to say that. What's interesting is after 1989, there seems to, to have some convergence, right? So for instance, the klezmerization of the past in places like Krakow, when you know, sort of it becomes some sort of tourism and the beautification of Jewish quarters in Budapest and Prague and so on and so forth. But it goes deeper than that. As a matter of fact, even dissidents played a role in this sort of philo-Semitic consciousness. Think of Milan Kundera, for instance. Right? So, at, in the middle of 1980s, both Austrians and Czech dissidents like Kundera decided that Mittel Europa was the f future of Europe. And with that, the memory of dead, liberal, cosmopolitan Jews that we have forgotten, but which he wanted to resurrect as the goal of the new European project. So the short answer is yes. Yes, it, it would be great to put these two things in dialogue instead of assuming that the night of communist anti-Semitism starts in 45 and, and ends in 1989. Um, my question is rather than to the opposite. I noticed that many of the Holocaust survivors, they have a guilt, guilty feeling against those who did not survive. Now, uh, the question is, uh, of course, uh, even non-Jews when they say didn't board an aircraft which then 
fell down and uh, so many died may, uh, do have sometimes these guilty feelings. But uh, isn't that contradictory to the Freudian theory that there should be some, some reason for a fault to have a guilty feeling? I don't know if I can answer to that. Uh, I, I don't know. Um, it's hard for me to put myself in, in this place. Um, so I will pass on this with your permission. I found uh, interesting your statement about the cause of philosophism. Uh, if I s understood correct, you said the the guilt is not a good cause of or is, uh, and you s talked about truth. It's I, I, I'm not sure if I stood, understood correctly, yeah. because the cause is about the past, but the truth is about the is the awareness about the presence and the future. And I referred to Uri Avneri, who said those who are fellow Semitists prob probably do not plea for the future of the state of Israel, because usually governments are not all the time in the interest of the people, because society is not united, is in, in classes, so to say. And the second thing about the right wing uh, lying with um, Israel, I think they have managed to change the enemy from Jews to uh, the Arab or Islamic immigrants. And secondly, they, they go with the victor. I mean, they, with the Israelis, of course, the victorious part of the conflict, and they, they like to go with the victor. And for the Germans, they like to, to sell weapons. It's not easy to sell weapons to, to Palestine people. Yeah, well, th thank you for your comment. And just one, one part of it I'll answer, the, the comment by Uri Avneri. You know, the, to paraphrase uh, Stalin, you know, uh, philo-Semitism, how many divisions? Uh, well, I don't know if you're familiar with, with, with Stalin's comment about the Vatican. Well, how many divisions? The divisions of philo-Semitism are in the United States. In the United States, these are evangelical divisions. And uh, to um, answer your question, evangelicals are the classic example who ultimately do not wish for the ultimate welfare of the Jewish people. Uh, their philo-Semitism is a transitory period at the price, of course, of colonization and policies in the territory of arriving to an ap apocalyptic event, that is to say, the resurrection of Christ and the dis disappearance of Jews. So, yeah, can you just... Yeah, yeah well, it's... Oh, okay. So, it's yes, not all philo-Semites work for the welfare of Jews, if this is what you wanted to say. Yeah. Uh, absolutely. Yeah. Because um, you mentioned also uh, the, the point that the hatred against Jews has been replaced by uh, hatred against Muslims and refugees and so on, but there was a comment here. I wonder, I mean, there are some people compare, trying to compare uh, anti-Semitism and anti-Arabism. Yeah. You don't see the, do you yeah, see any yeah, parallels That is there? a facile um, um, a, a, in comparison. No? There's the notion that today the new Jew is the Arab. Yeah. It's not that easy, it's not that, that clear. I mean, there's a specific set of attitudes towards migrants and Muslims which do not cancel other stereotypes or prejudices about Jews. And they can coexist and they coexist nicely. What's interesting, what's interesting and particularly so in Germany, that in that context, the Jew has become the model of what integration should be, right? Mm -hmm. So, um, for instance, last month, a young political scientist, um, Jewish, German, published a book, provocative in Germany, the title, Disintegriert euch. That is to say, don't use me as the normative symbol of what integration should be. Right? So that's quite interesting, is that the, the Jew has become the yardstick of successful integration in other countries too. I mean, I know that, I, I talked with that with a Bulgarian journalist um, yesterday, the United Patriot, a small far-right party, likes to compare the successful integration of Jews, for instance, with the negative integration of Sinti Roma or, or Turks. So Jews have become somehow the model of successful integration in European polities. But by just saying that, it's already recognizing that they're outsiders, that they had to integrate to, be, to begin with. So you understand how philo-Semitism can work both ways. Right? 
Is there any parallel between those who are fighting Islamophobia today uh, to philo-Semitism? So, the Islamophobes, if you want to take a shortcut, are the most ardent philo-Semites yes. today. Uh, we, we, we have that. So we have that with Gerd Wilders, perhaps Trump is one of them. But uh, yeah. those who are fighting it, those who are saying, no, we should not, we have to understand Islam, or accept it, uh, work toward integration, be open to refugees. Can you yeah. see any so, parallel there to, 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 of, to the pre to older philo-Semitism in Europe, or is it a different I, I think I, I think I think what, what we're getting at here is that for these people, they understand or try to challenge the meaning of philo-Semitism, that they are not accepting the idea that philo-Semitism should come at a price, that philo creates an anti, right? So this is, in a sense, the remnant of the progressive anti-Semitism that is under duress today, a, sort, a form of love that does not create hostility to compensate for it. Um, but that would go, in to go back to some sort of old anti-racist discourse, old universalist discourses that are under stress in all the polities of Europe today. Yeah. Um, two quick questions. Uh, if you agree with me that it's important to distinguish between uh, anti-Semitism and especially legitimate forms of anti-Zionism, uh, wouldn't you also agree with me that it's important to distinguish between philo-Semitism and philo-Zionism, as in love for the state of Israel? Yeah, of course, uh, absolutely. And yeah. second, the follow-up question, is the second included in your philo-Semitism uh, or not? Uh, is is, is fi philo-Zionism included in your version of so, philo-Semitism? So let me just answer you as an historian, as somebody who observed and tried to make sense of, of, uh, of patterns of expression. In the 1950s and 60s in Western Europe, it was more or less complementary, right? So for instance, the figure of your philosopher, the figure of Jean-Paul Sartre, Jean-Paul Sartre started his career as an intellectual doing something revolutionary, trying to say that the Jewish question does not exist, there is only an anti-Semite question. Right? So what we need to study is the anti-Semite, not the Jew. Something that is subversive and radical at the same time. But he completed that, and in fact, throughout his life, with some sort of solidarity with the state of Israel, even when he turned somehow closer to the Rote Armee and, and, and in the 1970s, a little kind of radical phase. Sartre never relinquished a connection to Israel. His argument, we cannot forget as French, and he says that to Arabs, I paraphrase, that the Israelis as are Jews too. And as Jews, he owes them a sense of solidarity. Complicated and qualified, but it owes them. So yes, after that, today, People who are philo-Semites can also be anti-occupation or anti-Israeli policies or even anti-Israel. I don't see a contradiction in that as long as the rhetoric is careful to never debase, um, a, so to speak, um, impugn, so to speak, the decency or the right to existence of Jews wherever they are. We're coming to the end of our session, so my final question is, when is your book going to be finished and when is it going to come out? Okay, so the, it should come out with uh, Cambridge University Press. I cannot tell you when, but it's work. It's, we're going within close to the end. It's coming close to the end. Yep. So I wish you good luck on okay. completing it and, and uh, hope it will have a good reception. Okay. And I would like to thank you very much. Well, thank you, Eric, and thank you all for being here tonight. And for you also, for your attention. <laughs>